Do you ever have a hard time coming up with your own original painting and drawing ideas? Today I'm going to show you how I come up with mine and walk you through how I painted an octopus and orcas whole underwater scene in acrylics. I often hear from artists that they feel they can't come up with original ideas. They don't know how you look at something like this. Where did you come up with that idea? For me, it's as simple as creating a collage. That's all I'm doing. I had four elements that I wanted to combine. An octopus, a wood tabletop, a melty or that glass bowl that's kind of melted over the wood base, and then fish or coral, something inside of that bowl. Once you've figured out which elements you want to include in this sort of collage, the next step is to figure out how they all work together. You can use Photoshop, as I did, or you can draw this all out in a sketch pad. The point is to do it before you hit the canvas. That way you can figure out how everything best fits together. So here, the first thing that I started with was to get a photo of a wood table. I knew that was element number one. The next thing, I wanted to put that melty bowl. I saw this in a shop, thought it was adorable, and definitely needed to use this. So I took a photo of that, Photoshop that on. And you don't have to be good at Photoshop to do that. As you can see here, I am doing a terrible job. I just need to get an idea of what my placement is going to be and how everything will fit together. The next thing that I did is to take a painting, one of my old paintings, I knew I needed something underwater, so we'll just use my own. And I Photoshopped that inside of the bowl. And again, you'll see here, I didn't need to do a good job. You can do a really, really terrible job and still get the idea of your proportions, of your perspective. That was sitting on top. We'll push that back so that it's in the bowl. And if you want to see exactly how I did this, I do have a live stream step by step of completing this and all of the Photoshop steps I took. But there's my design. I ended up using my Wacom tablet to draw out the octopus because I didn't have a good reference photo. So I actually combined about 20 different reference photos to get him. But as you can see, the Photoshop job didn't have to be perfect, but it's what I needed to come up with the balance. And I was able to change colors, change everything once I got onto the painting, make it look much better there. That is my whole design process, is draw the project out on something else first. Don't just jump straight into the canvas. Although, I'm not going to lie, sometimes I do that too because it's just fun. But I'm not going to do that on a canvas this big. Now this canvas is a 30 by 40 inch. It is a Frederick's Pro Series Belgian linen canvas. It's a box canvas, so it's the really thick canvas. Super smooth. I had them send me this one, and just for transparency, I am sponsored by Frederick's, although they're all I used anyway, so... I, I was going to use it regardless, but I contacted them. They shipped me three of these, so I've got two more big canvases to paint something on. I have no idea what those are going to be, but I went with this one because it is so smooth, and I knew on the octopus skin I had so much tiny detail that I wanted to do. If you're working on a rough canvas, something that has a little bit more tooth, then it's going to be a lot harder for you to get teeny, teeny, tiny detail coming out very, very smooth, like what I did on this guy. It's also going to be a lot harder for you to blend smoothly. A smooth canvas, especially, I, I use the smooth canvas oils or acrylics, but acrylics especially, just with the dry time, it's harder to paint on a, a rough canvas and get this kind of detail. So that is my first tip, is just start with a smooth canvas. Whichever canvas you want to go with, it, and obviously I recommend Frederick's, but whatever canvas you go with, make sure it has a smooth tooth, because if it's really rough, that's just going to make it a lot harder for you to get the fine detail and get smooth blending. This was a long project, and so I actually broke it up into two weeks on Patreon. So if you are a supporter over there, you've got almost four hours of video. Much of it is real time, so you can head over and check that out now if you have not already. If you're unfamiliar with Patreon, each week I upload a new one to two hour long tutorial complete with some real time clips. I've got over 150 videos over there already. You get all of that. You can get access to all of the old stuff instantly and a new one each week for as little as $4 a month. That's a lot of videos for $4 a month. It's entirely possible I'm a workaholic. But if you want to check that out, I will have a link in the video description. So let's go ahead and move on to this tutorial. This portion of the wood grain, I started off on the live stream. So I'll have a link pop up. You can check that out if you want to see that in real time. So we're going to go ahead and move forward from here. Basically for the wood grain, I'm just making a mess of different colors. I'm using mostly unbleached titanium white, a bit of raw sienna, and some black and dark browns. The point here is that I'm using multiple colors. So I've got the, high, the lightest color, my unbleached titanium white, go a little bit darker with the raw sienna, and just work my way down from there. I want variation. The pencil that I'm using here, I'm it's a white charcoal pencil from Generals, and I'll have a link to the supplies that I'm using in the video description if you need to check any of those out. 
but I've drawn that out. I don't need this line to be perfectly smooth. That's a big deal. I actually want this to be very, very rough. So I'm not going to use a ruler and draw out the per most perfect straight line you've ever seen. I make sure that it's about even going across, but the line itself doesn't need to be perfectly straight. So lining that out with black, and then I can come through. I just want to create texture here. I'm not going to worry about everything being perfect. If I decided I wanted more detail, and I thought I would, but once I painted the octopus in, I realized I really didn't need that much more detail on the wood grain. I want to get variation there, keeping it very sketchy back and forth. Mostly long horizontal lines. There aren't many diagonal lines. I have a few areas where there's knots in the wood and such, but the majority of the lines are going to be straight or very horizontal. So once I get that blocked in, I'm going to come back through and adjust my colors completely on the wood grain. I've got to warm them up, but for now they can stay where they are. So I'm going to start with the octopus. Now what I did, I designed all of this first in Photoshop and then I used my projector to project it onto the canvas and then used that same white charcoal pencil and drew everything out. That way I was sure that everything stayed in perspective. I'm not at all concerned about the color being perfect here. That is not important at all. I'm going to go back through, as you can see, the finished octopus. These colors are going to change completely. What I want is to make sure that I'm, I'm mixing a color that is opaque enough to cover up the wood grain. So I'm mixing a fair amount of titanium white. I've got some unbleached titanium white. That's the cream color you see on my palette. I've got some of that reddish brown color, a bit of magenta. I'm mixing a whole bunch of different colors just to get a base. And I could do this all with just unbleached titanium white if I want. But what I'm doing is starting to create texture, starting to create, te well, texture. I don't know why I'm making that sound like it's something really fancy. But I want, I'm letting my brush strokes show a bit. I'm letting a bit of the background show a bit because this is just going to add to that much more texture once I get onto the final layers. You can make things perfectly smooth if you want to. It's just not necessary and it works to my benefit to have it very messy like this. One of the things when I first started painting, I was so worried about every single thing being perfectly blended out. Everything had to be really, really smooth. The problem is you end up creating a more cartoony look. Not that this is, is super realistic in its own, but I mean, it ends up being very flat. It doesn't have that three-dimensional look. It, it's just too blended. I found that I like to look better when you can actually see some of those brush strokes, some of that texture in there. So mixing this kind of teal color, which is going to completely get covered up with much darker colors late, later, I'm just starting to map out where my general lights and darks are going to go. Nothing has to be perfect. I'm not worried about the colors I come up with. I know that I wanted something, you know, dark on this area. So here I'm starting to add a bit more of my Mars Black. I'm using Mars Black, not Ivory Black. Ivory Black is too translucent, so when you mix it with these other colors, it would have just darkened it up a little bit, but it wouldn't be this dark. Ivory Black, I prefer if I'm going to glaze black, but otherwise, if I want something to be really dark, I'm going to go with my Mars Black. Same thing, adding some of this texture over his face. Letting those brush strokes show. I'm almost doing these crosses back and forth, these little X shapes. And as you can see here, none of these colors are going to say, stay. I'm just starting to build up texture. It's really easy to get hung up on making sure every color has to be exact, every color has to be right. I didn't honestly know for sure which direction I was going to go on the color. I can change that later. None of that is terribly important. Just start painting. Don't get so hung up on, I need the perfect color. You can change the color later. What I want right now is to start blocking in my texture, start blocking in my general shapes. Now well, I'm going to pull this to portion here into real time so that you can see how slow this process is. It is not fast by any sense of the imagination. I'm using a liner brush. This is a synthetic hog hair liner brush. This one is probably a number one or a number two. I'm not positive, but I'm just starting to create this texture, these different shapes. Now it is very important that these shapes be different. I'm not trying to repeat the same exact shape over and over again. I want some variation there. And yeah, it's just slow. I've mixed some water in with the paint that I'm using. I'm using a combination of purple and black. There is some water that I've twisted into the brush because if you use straight paint, really, it's 
not normal for me to use straight paint out of the tube. I almost always thin it with a little bit of water or a little bit of mixing medium. More often than not with me, it's going to be water. I'm going to thin it down just a bit and see how it can flow nice and smooth. Now, I do have a video. I will have a link pop up so you can check that out that will show you how to use a liner brush. I show you how to load it and how not to use it. But what I'm doing here, it is slow. When everything's sped up, it gives you the illusion that it's fast to paint something like this. It took me about three weeks. This is not a quick thing to do. Now, I just want to stress that because it's easy to, to watch these videos when they're sped up and get the impression that you should be able to get this done in a single night. I mean, this video is what, half hour, 40 minutes? Yeah, you should easily be able to do this in a few hours. No, it's not. This is many, many hours sped up. You can see with the liner brush, I'm not pushing very hard. Some areas I'm pushing a little bit harder if I want the line to be thicker so that I get some of that variation. But most of it, I'm going to keep a very, very light hand. And I'm not worrying about changing the colors. I'm also not worried if I mix the exact same color every time. I'm going to add so much detail over this. I'm going to do so much glazing. Most of this is going to get pushed back. It's not going to stay this well defined. And I also don't want this to start looking like scales. So I don't want to just start making a bunch of U's where they overlap and it, that would look like scales. Those thin lines are just from barely pushing. One of the, the mistakes that a lot of people make is they think that they're going to get thinner lines if they use a smaller paintbrush. The small paintbrushes with the little teeny tiny short hairs, short bristles, those fray really quickly. They, they work okay for one or two uses, but after that, paint starts to build up near where the bristles are attached to the handle, and they just don't hold their shape that well. So they're not going to work really well and, and get that fine detail long term. These liner brushes with the longer, about an inch long, with the bristles like this work so much better. And the synthetic hog hair are my favorite. Second favorite would be the Taclon bristled brushes. But I like how the synthetic hog hair hold their, their shape. And I'm going to continue this pattern all the way through the rest of this. It's actually very boring, very tedious. Seriously, put on a movie or an audiobook or something because it gets boring. This is hours of just creating this sort of detail so that I have the texture I want when I glaze over it. And most of this right now, everything's going to look very flat because it's just all that same color everywhere. And there's not a whole lot of variation in the, I mean, there is variation in the shape, but not that, that much. So it'll look very, very flat. But this is just a base layer. Once I put the glazes on top, then it just looks like texture. Then the certain areas get to toned down. You end up with a look that has that texture that I'm going for. And if I don't mix the same color, like here, I don't have quite as much black mixed in with my purple. It's okay. It doesn't really matter. I just want to build, again, just building texture. It's pretty boring, but I need that first. And here's the other thing. I do want this to be fairly dark for most of it because I need the contrast. Once I start glazing other color on top of it, most of that contrast is going to be lost. It's not going to be as harsh as what you're seeing there starting to build up on the eye. And this is going to be a little bit of a challenge because for me, I didn't have one single reference photo. I had, you know, like 20 different reference photos of different octopus that were not royalty free. I couldn't copy any single one of them. All I could do is look at them to get an idea. And I knew I wanted kind of a rainbow color, just a huge mixture of color on mine. So I was going to have a huge difference there from anything that's super realistic. But I, I didn't have one single thing to copy, so I had a lot of reference photos that I was going through. And that part comes back to what I was talking about with changing the color, having the ability to change color, not worrying about what color it is now, because I honestly didn't know. Once I got further along, once I painted in the bowl with the ocean, I had no idea what colors were going, what I was would, might want to change on the octopus. Because the original, the Photoshop version, I had him very tan. I knew I wanted the colors to be more bold than that. I just didn't want to waste too much time messing with it in Photoshop. Once I had the general idea of the shape of the octopus, I just wanted to get started on painting. And it's so easy to glaze color and adjust things that when you start feeling that you're worrying about, I've got to find the exact right color, just change it. Just paint over it if you don't like something. Don't be afraid of your colors. So here I'm taking white and I'm pulling out highlights on a few, on the inside of a few of these little bumps or I don't even know what I want to call them. The little 
I want to call them tiles, and that is definitely not going to be the right word, but the little shapes that I have in there. I just want a few highlights here and there, again, just adding to the variation so that it's not too uniform. And it's not going to stay white. I will glaze right over it. But the areas that I'm painting white now, when I choose whichever color I'm going to glaze, which in my case will be a lot of oranges and reds, that is going to be brighter. It'll be a brighter orange than whatever is next to it. And then areas like, let's say, in the case of orange, where I've got blues and grays, if I glaze the orange on top of the blues and grays, I'm going to get a much more dull color. So that just adds to having a lot of variation in what I have here. But it's easier for me to paint like this, just worrying about my values, get, getting my detail, getting my values, and then glaze my colors later on. It is so much easier than trying to figure out which color you want now and painting it the exact right color every single brush stroke. For me, this is just, it's not a paint by number. There are going to be a lot of layer, a lot of layers. And if you think of it that way, in terms of layering, I think it makes it less scary when you're worried about which color do I use? I don't know what color to use. And I bring up the color thing because it's something that I'm asked so often and it seems to be one of the biggest hangups that kind of slows down beginning artists. They're so worried about making a mistake in color that they almost end up paralyzed and they don't move forward. Color, not that big of a deal. If you don't like the color you painted something, glaze over it. Make the adjustment. But you've got to experiment as you're painting in order to improve. And making mistakes is a part of that. You're going to have times where you're just like, huh, didn't like how that came out. And you'll see that later on. There were quite a few times where I did that and I went through and made changes. That's how you learn. That's how you figure out what you do like and what does look good. Now that highlight you just saw me paint on there, those that was just the trans, gosh, forgot the name, transparent mixing white. I used that so that it's very translucent. You can still see the detail underneath, but it lightened a lot of those areas up. So now he's starting to look a little bit more three-dimensional. He's getting some highlights, getting some shadows. He doesn't look so much now like just this flat surface that I started with a few minutes ago. Getting some of this orange color, oranges and browns. I'm actually mixing some purple with my oranges to get the brown tone. Just glazing that over that. And I'm using water for my glaze. I am not using any, I actually didn't use glazing medium at all in this piece. When I use water, you don't want to thin it down so much that it's just running off the canvas. It, you're just thinning it to make it, I'm well, kind of a combination. One, I need it thin enough to flow smoothly. smoothly. The other is that I want it to be more translucent. Now, I am also using colors that are translucent anyway, so I don't have to add a lot of water to make that happen. Taking a bit of this aqua green color, I think it's called light aqua green. I may have that wrong, don't quote me. But I'm using some of that. Gonna get some more detail in here. Almost makes him look a little shimmery. So the first leg, I painted that on the live stream. I will have a link in the video description if you wanna check that out. So I didn't include it in this because you can see that real time. Now I'm gonna go on to the other legs and I basically did the same thing that I did for the body minus all the little liner brush. I didn't put in as much texture. I want some texture so I, so I just got that by, as you can see here, just kind of using the liner brush back and forth, but I'm not doing the actual little I won't, they're not really octagons, but we'll call it that for now. You guys know what I mean. Got the hint of some of the suction cups on the bottom there. I am full of technical terms, by the way. This is not where you come when you want to learn actual names of things. So I've got some purple, that brownish orange color. Same thing, just kind of blocking in approximately where everything is going to go. I'm going to go back and clean all this up later. Let's move on to the next blocking in my general shape getting some purple in there i'll throw in some of the reddish brown and i'll end up changing the color on a lot of this later on because once i got everything blocked in i realized certain things were just blending in too much with other areas like the wood that the the jar is sitting on or the bowl is sitting on i had to make a lot of adjustments just to make sure that one area was standing out enough from the next and as I start on the wood here, that I'm keeping a fairly loose brush stroke. Same, basically the same thing I did on the octopus. I'm just kind of paying attention to where my lights and my darks are going to go. None of those tentacles are quite finished. 
one of the challenges when you don't have a definite reference photo, I have, you know, a reference photo of the bull and of the wood, but it's not exact. I'm not copying any of it exact. So one of the challenges is that once you start painting, you may realize, whoa, those colors don't look right together. I'm going to have to make an adjustment. So I don't want to put too much detail on any given, any single area here until I get further along where I can better judge where I need to go. Okay, more contrast, more whatever. I'll do the, the tight, really clean detail. I'm going to hold off on that till I get further along. So it's a little bit different than what you would see me do on a lot of things where I've got a definite reference photo for everything. Those I seem, I tend to work a little bit more cleanly early on. Here, not so mu much. I'm being very, very messy as I block everything in. Lot of unbleached titanium white. And that's the color, if you don't own it, you don't you don't have to go out and get it. You can mix it on your own with some brown, some yellow ochre or yellow oxide, I believe is what it's called with the Liquitex Basics. But it's it just saves time. It's a color I use so much that it's one, one tube of paint I go through faster than almost anything else. I think I use that more than I do titanium white. And working on my shadows, just darkening areas up, brightening other areas. If you've not painted like this, it is fun because you, if you can get over the stress of every single thing needs to be perfect, it, there, I have nothing to compare it to to make it perfect. I don't have a reference photo that I can say, okay, this matches exactly, so I know it's good. But if you can get over that and just have fun with it and experiment, it is an absolute blast. Because you get to make decisions more, and not that you can't do that anyway, but I feel like you get to make a few more decisions based on what you think looks good, not necessarily what is correct. And on this especially, I did that a lot. When I come through and put the yellow, or not yellow, the blue reflection on the bottom side of the octopus of some of his legs, of his body, that's not correct. It doesn't make sense. Where is that blue coming from? I mean, I guess it could partially be off camera, but you would get some of that reflecting on, on the wood grain. I put it there because I think it looks nice. And that that was all it came down to. So that's where I was talking about it being a little bit more freeing. You can make choices based on, you just think it looks good because you're, it, it's, you don't have a reference photo that you're completely tied to. So it's just a lot of fun. Now, I don't want to put a whole lot of detail at all. I mean, less than everywhere else even on the tentacle that is going in front of the bowl. Because once I start blending the bowl, that's going to completely get painted over. So I just have the hint of where that goes, but there's no real need or a reason for me to put much detail into that. Now, for the bowl itself, this bowl is very, very warped. It is not supposed to be perfectly round. That was one of the thing, reasons I wanted to use this. It has this very surreal, it's kind of melting over the wood look. And I'm just going to start with a base color. I mixed this teal color by about half phthalo blue, half phthalo green, and some white. And the first layer is going to have a lot of brush strokes. This is going to take me a few layers before I get it as smooth as I want it to be. So you can see all of these brush strokes on here. doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just my base. Then I'm going to use a mop brush, which in my case is actually a blush makeup brush, and fan out, just lightly go over those brush strokes to get rid of as much as possible. I then dried it with a hair dryer, made sure it was completely dry, and now I'm going to put my next layer, and I'm going to repeat that process until it's really opaque and I've gotten rid of most of the brush strokes. Some can show. I'm going to be painting so much coral and other things inside fish, and I've got some orcas that are going to go in this. It'll hide a lot, but I do want to get it fairly smooth. I am mixing a little bit of water, but not much here. I really don't want this to be very translucent. I actually want the opacity. And that's part of what why I use the titanium white mixed in with this. It's not just that I want this to be a light teal color. You'll see it. Well, you can see on the finished painting, I've got to darken a lot of this up. But the reason that I need so much white is the white, my titanium white is very opaque. So that is going to cover that dark background better than if I used less of it. So I've got to dry that. Going to do another layer. And this is a Taclon Bristled Filbert brush that I'm using here. That one is by Royal Soft Grip. You can get those. I think Michaels carries them, and I actually get them online. I'll have a link, again, to those supplies that I'm using. That one, I believe, is listed on my website. So I'll have a link to the supply list over there if I don't have it in the video description. I want to get a hint of some of the octopus showing through the glass bowl. 
using that for his tentacle. Although the tentacle, once I paint in the coral, you won't really see, but you will see a little bit of this texture of his face through the bowl, not too much. And then the color will be corrected once I start airbrushing. So I'm airbrushing this teal color. I'm using Holbein airbrush paints. I used to use Createx, and while those still would work, they're more likely to clog, it, especially this airbrush. So the Holbein doesn't do that, and the Holbein doesn't need to be thinned out like the Createx did. Now, if, normally, I would try to make this super, super smooth. The thing is here, because I was being lazy, I decided against getting out Frisket to make sure that I didn't get the airbrush paint all over the outside or the overspray. If you want it really smooth, you're generally going to hold the airbrush back a little bit further than what I'm doing here. Because I'm so close, I'm going to get it to where it's a bit more streaky. For this project, it doesn't really matter. So that allowed me to go ahead and be lazy and not worry about it, knowing how much of this would get covered when I put the, the highlights in the bowl. If I were doing just an underwater scene, that would be different. Then I don't want streaks. Then I'm going to make sure I hold the airbrush back a little bit better, use better techniques, and get that much, much smoother. But because I'm going to, be, there's just so much to hide any mistakes I make that it, it's just not that important. So I can be a little bit messy. Use some white airbrush paint there little too bright, so I came back through with the teal color, toned that down a bit. You can see that the, the tentacle there is really covered, so that's why I didn't want to put too much detail in. Now this section, we just jumped ahead because this you can watch in real time over on the live stream or up till this point. Now this coral here that I'm painting, this is an example of, I made a mistake, I painted in a different type of coral, quickly realized that didn't look good, I'm just painting a different type of coral in its place. If something comes out bad, just paint over it. It's not the end of the world. Don't get so hung up on the idea of making mistakes or the, the possibility of making a mistake that you don't move forward. Try things. If it doesn't work, paint over it. It is sad. You can't permanently mess something up or mess something up to an extent that you can't fix it. Don't be afraid of your mistakes. That's how you learn, but it's also the only way you're going to move forward. Otherwise, I've seen so many people that just don't finish things because they're so worried to mess it up. It looks good right now, so I'm just going to leave it in my closet and never finish it because I'm afraid to mess up where I'm at now. Well, now you have a painting that's not finished, so not only are you not learning from it, it's unfinished, so it doesn't matter if it was messed up or not. Finish your work. Don't, get par don't be paralyzed by the potential of a mistake. Mistakes are a good thing. And just blocking in the idea of where corals will go. And I say the idea because this is loose and messy and I may completely change things as I move, move along. And what I like to do are find royalty-free reference photos uh, over on Pixabay usually is where I get most of them for coral. But of aquariums, you're, it's harder to find good ones of the actual ocean. But if you can find some coral of the inside of, of you know, a reef aquarium, look up reef tank, marine tank, marine fish tank. Those would be some search terms you may want to try or just coral sometimes will be listed or you'll find what you're looking for. You can get the general idea of some of these shapes. I'm going to completely change colors based on what works well for me because most of these colors, if you change the light, the, the color looks totally different anyway. So I don't feel like I have to match the color exactly. I am pretty free on what mine ends up like just based on I think this color would look good in this spot and it's one of the things that I like so much about coral it's kind of like painting roses they come in so many different colors that you can paint you can change the color just based on that's what works for my painting so those orcas, that is all drawn out. I actually traced out my bowl. I took a piece of tracing paper, taped it to my painting, traced the bowl, and then I could draw out the orcas and get them the exact size and shape that I wanted. So I didn't have to just take a charcoal pencil and freehand that directly onto the piece. Because if I did that, sometimes those when you make eraser marks, they'll show a little bit. And I still wanted the background water there to be very smooth. So by drawing it where I could make any erasing mark, eraser marks that I needed onto another piece of paper, Paper, I could then use transfer paper and transfer it and have my lines be nice and clean and that kept my background water from having any smudge marks. So back into my coral, just building up more shadows, paying attention to where highlights and shadows should be. Little details and you can see I'm not at all worried about fish yet. I'm painting this like fish aren't even there. I will work fish in through this, but I find it to be easier just to paint the coral like they're not there. Now, if this were a piece where let's say I wanted a big, huge angelfish up front, I'm going to draw, I would draw him instead of 
painting coral first and then covering an entire coral with a fish. But I didn't want that for this piece. All of the fish that I'm going to paint in are going to be really small. So it's easier than to go ahead and paint the coral and then paint the fish on top of it. So onto the orcas. I'm going to, I want them to be lighter. I make, I'm not really using a whole lot of black. I'm mixing a little bit of black with a blue, but it's mostly blue and some purple. I don't want to just paint everything straight black and white. They're in the water. I need them to look like they're in the water. And in that case, those blue colors, the teal colors, all of that would be reflecting. I need highlights for sure on the upper section of their back where the light is hitting them, but it's not just straight black and white. And that is something that you want to avoid when you are painting orcas. If they're out of the water, they're jumping out of the water, you're going to have harsher black and white colors. But when they're underwater, if you want them to look like they're in the distance, you want to make sure that you've got a lot of the water color. So in this case a lot of the teals. I've got some darker blue. I want those colors on, on them and especially on the white. On the white you're not going to have that much white because they're in the distance. You've got water between the viewer and the, the orca. Coming back through again, getting some more highlights on the coral while I let that section of the orcas dry. Now, I could have just taken a hair dryer and dried them and continued working on them if I wanted to, but I had so much work to still do on the coral, it just was easier for me to let that section dry and I'll come back to it. But right now, look at how messy the edges are on the orcas. They are a hot mess. They need a lot of work to clean up those edges. So they don't leave them at that stage. It looks terrible. So I'm using purple on top of them now over the areas that are the darkest black. It's actually purple that I'm glazing there. Got some highlights with the white. Again, it's not straight white though. Fading that out. Now what I'm doing is adding the white paint, which actually isn't white, it's just a very light teal type color, and I'm using a clean separate brush to smudge that in to the darker blue color on the white portion of the orca using my liner brush to start getting some of the reflections from the water surface on their back. Make sure those lines are curved so that it follows the shape of the orca. And those are a bit too bright white. I can tone those down. I'll glaze color over it. So it's easier just to get a light color, whatever it is. I don't worry about it being the perfect color. I'm going to glaze another color on top. I mean, I can just use straight white if I want to at that point, just to save time and not have to worry about mixing color. Now you can see I'm starting to clean up those edges. Watch that in your work. Make sure that things are clean where they should be clean. I don't want fluffy looking whales or orcas. Starting to put in the surface of the water. See how I leave some of the underwater section showing through those light bits. Just kind of sketchy back and forth. I've completely painted over the tentacle that is in the water. I'll add that back in later. I'm going to fade to darker and darker as I move back. Back to some details on the orcas. This tentacle I'm going to have to brighten up a lot to make it really stand out. Right now it just kind of blends in. It almost looks like it's inside the bowl which could kind of be a cool effect like it was going through it but not where I was going with this one. I'm using my white charcoal pencil and drawing that tentacle. He's petting his orca there. See, look, he's a friendly octopus. I've got a bit of blue on that tentacle too because I want to make sure that it looks like that is in the water as well. If it was the same color as all the other tentacles outside of the water, it wouldn't look like it was inside the bowl. Start getting some of the white highlights on the edge of the bowl there. Now with the way that this is sped up, it looks like I'm doing a bunch of little sketchy brush strokes. I'm not. You want to try to get, when you want smooth edges like on the outside of a bowl here or if you're painting a glass, try to get that as much as possible in one brush stroke. As few brush strokes as possible. If you're doing a whole bunch of little sketchy brush strokes, your bowl will look fluffy. It'll look furry and you don't want that. So try to get the outside edges of, a, of cups, bowls, anything like that in one stroke as much as possible. You can go back and add other strokes on top, but don't do that in, you know, 20 little strokes to get the one edge. It won't come out smooth. 
So for the fish, what I'm doing is painting them in solid white to start with. This way, the colors that I'm going to paint over them, because a lot of these fish are going to have yellow in them. If I paint them straight yellow, yellow is too translucent. You're not, they're not going to really show up against the dark blues or the black of the orcas. By painting the white first, the white is opaque, and so that's going to cover up my darker colors, and then I can paint the color of the fish that I want on top and still have those colors remain nice and rich. That's a complaint that I've I've heard people say with the Liquitex Basics that the pigment is, they're not highly pigmented. And so let's say you wanted an orange fish. If you try to just paint orange, that orange is so translucent, it's not going to look orange. But if I paint it white first, then I can put whatever color on top I want and it'll be nice and bold. I may have to put a couple of coats, that's fine. Now, the further back I go, these fish in the background, the masked butterfly fish, I, while they are all bright yellow fish, as I move further away from the viewer, that means they are deeper in the water, I want there to be a bluish tint or that greenish tint on them. I don't want them to be as bright yellow as the ones that are up close. Same thing, these little yellow or orange guys in the background, they're going to have a bit of that greenish blue color mixed in so that they look like they're off in the distance, whereas the ones that are up closer will be a brighter, more bold orange. So not only am I affecting the perspective so it looks like the water is deep by based on the size of the fish, obviously up close is going to be bigger, but I'm also having an impact just based on the color that I'm using. By cooling off the color, adding the blues and greens to it, that makes them look farther away as well. Not just farther away, but further in the water. They're in deep water back there. Using a liner brush for a lot of the detail on the fish up front. I'm not going to try to force that much detail on the ones in the background either. The closer they are to the viewer, the more detail I'm going to add. Further away, the less detail. If you try to add as much detail to the ones in the back as you do to the ones up close, it just doesn't look right. You, it kind of screws up your perspective. You don't need the same amount of detail on every square inch. Sometimes it's better to have less. So for these powder blue tings, I'm going to do the same thing. They are going to have white, and then I'll put the yellow for the fin on top should be actually yellow. But if I just painted it yellow, the yellow is too translucent. It's not going to show up. So I painted that portion of the fin white, let it dry, and then I can go on top with the yellow. Make sure as you're painting, do not leave your paintbrush sitting with paint on it on your palette. It's something that we do all the time with oil. You don't want to do that with your acrylic brushes. They will dry out and be damaged really quickly. You also don't want to leave them in your water well. It's normal to have a cup or a jar or something with water that you're rinsing your brushes in. It's easy to think, okay, I'll just set it in the water for now so it doesn't dry out and then I'll, I'll deal with it when I'm ready. Don't do that. You will damage the, the tips of the bristles of your brush so quickly. I mean, within minutes, they'll start to be damaged. Never leave your paintbrush sitting in the jar of water. Rinse them off and then set them to the side to dry. Don't leave them sitting in that water. One of the fastest ways to ruin your brushes. It, just, it Basically, it frays the tips of them is the, the main problem that you have when they sit in the water like that. Starting to get some of the highlights on that tentacle. So now it's starting to look, look more like it's in front of the glass. And then you can see the one in the water, how much more blue is on that one. Again, working on the water surface. A lot of sketchy lines, a lot of horizontal lines there. For the water or the edge of the bowl, this isn't straight white. You can see it on my palette, I'm mixing a bit of my teal color into a lot of this. On some of this, I'll mix some green. Some is white, some is going to be unbleached titanium white, some will be aqua, some will be green. There's variation on that jar. Oh, that's way too dark. So on that line where I didn't like it, all I did, the paint underneath was dry, so I didn't mess anything up. All I had to do is take a, a clean brush with some water and just wipe that area off. Where I, I went too dark, as soon as I made that brush stroke, it was a huge, oh, that doesn't look okay. Remove it by adding a bit of water and it'll lift off. As long as you're using a quality paint and what's underneath is dry, it's not going to lift the previous layer. Now, if you're using a generic 
brand paint, or even I've seen Reeves does it really bad. Some acrylic paints, you'll put down one layer, you'll put down the second layer, the first layer is totally dry, but the first layer will still lift off. So it doesn't work with every brand. You With a quality brand though, you should be able to wipe off an area that you messed up without damaging the previously dry layers. So that jar is mostly done. Now we're just on to some final details. The majority of what I need to do right now is just glaze things. So I'm glazing some of this reddish or kind of orangish brown color. I want to warm up the wood grain. Not necessarily because it's correct, but because I thought it would look better. I messed around with it in Photoshop and I really like that. And actually, at the very end, once I took my final final photo of this, I was doing the photo editing to make it look as much like the original photo as possible because it's always a little bit different when you take a photograph depending on the lighting. So I was messing with that. And one of the, the changes that I noticed is that the oranges on the octopus and on the wood grain were so much warmer, so much more orange than what my painting was. And so so I actually went back through and glazed even more orange after I was done filming. When I, I took that photo and saw what that would look like, I liked it so much better that I went and just glazed straight orange over more of the octopus and the wood that he's sitting on. But I really liked that contrast, the warm oranges with the blue of the water. One of the things that I really like with the Liquitex Basics, with the oranges and reds and yellows, for a while I didn't like that because they, they don't have a ton of pigment. They're extremely translucent. I love them for glazing though. The more I, I started glazing, I realized they're actually perfect for that. I don't have to thin them much with water, just on their own. They're nice and translucent. The color is so bold, very, very pretty, absolutely perfect for glazing and tinting color because I can still see all the detail underneath. They're so translucent. You can see right through them. But for glazing, you can see now, now, as I went back through and added the glazing of oranges, and I just used straight orange. I didn't, it has a yellowish tint on the wood grain, but the, the color that I had glazed was just orange to get that on both the wood and the octopus, and it gave me these nice, bold colors. But as you're painting, don't worry about, on your first layers, don't stress yourself out about making colors absolutely perfect. It doesn't really make a huge difference. Worry more about your values, your contrast, how light your lights are, how dark your darks are. You can go through and glaze color really easily and tint them whether you want to make them more blue more orange more whatever you can so easily adjust the color later on to be whatever you want it to be so on those earlier layers if they're not perfect don't don't fuss over it too much don't spend too much time trying to make every little brushstroke every little color perfect you can change all of that later on this is one of the biggest paintings I have painted in years. I've done murals, many murals in the past that were, you know, huge, huge walls. But on canvas, I have not painted a canvas this big in so long. I loved it because you can get a lot of detail in in a space that when I take a photo, it looks kind of little. The bowl was actually, I mean, about that big on there. So I had plenty of room to paint lots of little fish. When I shrink that down for prints, it's going to look absolutely amazing. The drawback is, oh my gosh, this took forever. If you are new to painting and drawing, I don't usually recommend you start with too big of a painting. It can be a bit overwhelming and discouraging. One of my favorite sizes to start students out on is about an 11 by 14. And do more of a study, maybe the face of an animal or a couple of fish, not a full underwater scene. Usually save that till, I'd say two, three, four, 10 paintings down the line. It makes it a little bit easier to not get so overwhelmed. It's not so hard to blend. Trying to blend on a canvas this big too, especially in acrylics, it can be a little bit discouraging. So if you're just getting started, I would recommend go a bit smaller. Don't jump into something like this if you have a tendency to get frustrated easily. I'd love to know though, what are your favorite size canvases to work on? Do you like to work really large, really small? Do you like round canvases, square canvases? Let me know in the video description. I vote round canvases up to 30 inches and rectangle canvases 18 by 24. Definitely my two favorite. Hey, have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going to it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new videos every single week. Sometimes it's just live streams because some stuff giving you the evil eye octopus take way too long to paint and so I end up being a little behind. But make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on anything. Maybe click the little notification bell so YouTube actually lets you know when there's a new video up. I've got a colored pencil video coming next week. I think that's good. We're going with done.